understanding the technology that powers the money is essential. Knowing the business drivers that inspire how the money is made is crucial. Bridging the gap between the mind of the technologist and the mind of the business is monumental. That is what TBF is all about. Let's start this never ending conversation. It's time. Welcome to another episode of the Tech Behind FinTech. I'm your host, Anand Yoswalu. Today, we're bringing you a show, The Backbone of FinTech, a deep dive into payment rails. Before we get into that, I want to introduce my guest, Ifi Jide Ebeogo. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me, Nandi. Hi, everyone. So um, before we get into the show, I just want to do some housekeeping. We are streaming live from Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube and Twitch. Also, we have a stream going from Instagram. Let me get that uh, kicked off on our Instagram page, the tech behind um, FinTech. And we also have a, a live stream going from from our uh, my personal account as well. So those are the places we are streaming from. If we, you know, if you and I were, I, so let, let's give some background. If he is located in Lagos, Nigeria, obviously you can tell by my name, I'm Nigerian by way of Brooklyn, New York. So obviously uh, we've been working on certain pronunciations. So she's been helping me out with that. And I appreciate her for that. Um, so that's the inside joke we both been having. If he, let me read your bio before we um, jump into it. Oh, before I jump into your bio, it seems like we are, we have a comment Hillary is saying, is this live or am I watching the recording? No, oh, this is very much live. You are, this is live, like live TV. Thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate you. Um, Hi, Hillary. Okay. Let me read Ify's extensive bio and we'll jump into it. Ify Jude Ibeogo is a payments expert, 16 years of experience in the fintech industry. She has excellent knowledge of payments technology, cards, protocols, as well as B2B payments. Her competencies include payment, switch, card, and terminal implementation, product strategy, and business development across Sub-Saharan Africa. She is currently the founding partner of the Payment Law, a fintech insights company. So Ify, thank you very much for joining. I'm really excited about this topic. One, because I am i don't know anything about it besides what I researched for this show. So I, I want to jump into it. We talk about payment rails. What, what exactly is payment rails? So um, from a first principles definition, in, in fintech banking payments, you know, um, and all the subjects, what we are doing is we are moving money, right? Um, we are moving money on infrastructure. And thinking about a transport analogy, just like the transport system helps you to move human beings using vehicles from one place to another, we need rails to move this money from point A to point B. So any infrastructure that helps facilitate the movement of money from a sender to a recipient, from a payer to a payee, from point A to B, you know, whatever the use cases are, that thing is a payment and infrastructure. Um, to move that definition just a little bit, again, looking at the transport um, analogy. So you're not just talking about the waterways or the railways or the roadways. You're also talking about the kind of vehicles that can move, the kind of protocols or regulations that regulate the movement of these things. You're also talking about the kind of technology, right, that moves um, this thing. So the same thing with, with, with money. Money, there are vehicles that are used to move money from one place to the other. They differ per region, per market. There are various technologies that have been assigned, you know, for protocol stake, for standardization, standardization stake, you know, that help to move money from one place to another. So this is payment rails. That's interesting. So, you know, based on what you're telling me, can I, I'm going to make an analogy. And I want you to correct me where I'm incorrect with this analogy. Mm -hmm. If we're going to associate the money with a person, let's say instead of we, instead of using the word money, we use a person, right? Now, a person yeah. 
needs to get from point A to point B. Let's say a person needs to get from, um, uh, a lot of the people here are, are in North America. So they have to get from New York to LA, right? Mm -hmm. Multiple ways to get from New York to LA, right? Let's say they were to fly. The airplane itself will be considered a payment rail. Let's yes. yes. Let's say they were to. The, the airways will be considered a payment rail. The airplane is a vehicle. So that will be the yeah. thing that is transporting the people. The ticketing system is also part of the whole thing. So how do you get on the payment? How, how do you get on the airplane? You can't go at a time of boarding um, in most cases and say, hey, I want to get on the plane now. You should have booked ahead and you're going to be booked in a particular class, economy, business class, first class, that kind of thing. That also depends on how you are treated. Same thing with money. There are some vehicles you put money on and money goes really fast and it's quite expensive. And there are vehicles you put money on and before it gets to its destination, it will take a while. You know, and there are also advancements in how these movements happen, which I guess we'll get to. So yes, that's a very good understanding. Okay, so no, I think I, I totally get it because we can relate that to whether, the like in terms of speed now, if I'm driving from New York to LA, right? The uh -huh. road pathway will be considered a payment rail. The exactly. vehicle, which is the, the car, the, the car will be considered one of the vehicles. And, you know, then we have to stop. Or, you know what a better analogy is? Instead of the car, if I was taking a bus there, right? Uh -huh. I have to buy a bus ticket. And exactly. obviously, if I, we were to use a plane, that would be faster versus the bus. But the the actual pathway there that is the payment rail if we're making yeah. an analogy so that's yeah, accurate yeah. yes that's not wow, good. See that in under three minutes i i understand payment rail. I, I'm, I feel i'm an expert in it <laughs> but yeah, that's that's awesome i thank you for that because that's what was always um uh co confusing me all right hillary has another so we have a um so here's here's what we do right we love our audience interaction. So I will always, if you're if you're commenting on LinkedIn, um, YouTube, or Twitch, I'll add you your comment to the show. On Instagram, we could just read your comment. So if you commented on Instagram, that may be the case. Hillary, thank you very much for this question. This brings a whole new meaning to fast money. No, in, in, in indeed. So you you mentioned now, you know. So what are some are uh, like how do bank wires fit into the modern uh, payment landscape? How does that how does that work? That's a good question. So um, when you talk about bank wires, there are two main categories for bank wires. You have the domestic bank wires where it's the same currency. It's normally in the same country. Um, the banks that are interacting are in the same locality, um, the same central bank or reserve bank you know governs them whilst if you're talking about international um, wire transfers you're talking about across regions across countries and sometimes even across continents so very quickly um swift many people are used to swift swift is one of the de facto and um, they're not the only ones but they're the ones you know we can easily identify that are the rails for the bank wires that are executed internationally whilst the bank wires that are executed um, locally or domestically have different um, players depending on the locality you're looking at. So I guess in North America, um, you, you all in the US will be used to something called the Fed wire, right? So that's um, what the um, bank wire thing is all about. Um, I would say these are the first grade or the traditional players in the digital payment space they are very cheap right and um, but they also had a lot of backdrops they are very cheap and had a lot of back um, a lot of um problems with it like the problems of speed and sometimes even security um and so every other thing we are seeing now um across various regions are uh, innovating on that um, drawback but the first in the game for transferring money quickly from one place to another we are the bank wires all right, so interesting. So when we start thinking about payment rails, we just have to understand traditionally 
what are all the ways that money gets from point A to point B? Many people, you know, obviously know, know bank wires. We have another question from the audience too, but I'm going to jump to you, Dr. Romy. Um, bank wires, um, people are also, nowadays, people are used to fintech companies that are sending like Cash App or Zelle or um, just various ways. How does that relate? So like the cash app perspective, right? Where a lot of a lot of people in the audience, especially on Instagram, they use cash app and different things of that nature. How how does that relate to payment rails? So um let's go back to payment rails and uh, let me yeah. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me. It looks like there is a glitch here. You, and... I can okay. hear you clearly. Sometimes the video pauses, but I can hear you clearly. Okay, cool. So um, let's go back to payment rails. So we've taken off, you know, a very solid understanding of payment rails. Now it's time to look at what differences, the different kind of payment rails we have, especially the most dominant ones. So payment rails are categorized based on the kind of value you're moving. Right. So um, back in the days, everybody had cash. And if you wanted to buy something and you didn't have cash, you basically didn't buy it. So you, know, you had cash then. Then it moved to checks. So you could write checks, you know, in favor of whoever it is. And those checks get executed depending on the laws that are in that market. And then we moved to what they call the ACH. And ACH is a kind of payment rail where you're supplying two things you're supplying the account number you're sending the transfer to and you're supplying a way of identifying how to get there it's like supplying um a pin to an address that you're going to again using the transport system and then supplying a particular house number so the person knows this is the way to navigate on google to get to that place but when i get to this estate okay i've gotten to reviews or whatever it is you know whatever that estate is where exactly am i going to drop off this package you know and that's the account number so that's what ach you know does then there were advancements on that um and then you now had the card networks and um, but let me come back to ach a bit so what happens in ach is if i say i'm sending an ach transaction to you and i send you my email it's not going to work. What I need is an account number. It's just the same way if I want to deliver something to your house and you send me an email address instead of a house number, it's not, you know, it's not the, it's not the information I'm looking for. It's not, um, it doesn't align with the protocols of the rails I am using. Um, these analogies will come um, very useful later on. Um, so if you are executing a transfer or a money push, if you're transferring money on a rail that is a card rail, but you're doing that with an account number, it's not going to work. Just like if you're executing a transaction on a crypto rail and then you're using a card number to do that, it's not going to work. So for each protocol, you know, for, for each rail, you have to adhere to the protocols of those reels, right? Just like if you are sending a package or, or an Amazon delivery to my house and I'm giving you an email address instead of a house number, you're never going to get that package, right? So three main reels, um, if you're looking at the kind of um, information you're supplying on those reels, three main reels, the account reels where you are supplying an account number for the money to get its destination, the card rails, where you're supplying a card number for the money to get to its destination. And then very lately, crypto, where you're supplying a crypto address, whatever it is, a string, the string of numbers, right? For the money or for the value to get to its destination. Um, on the background of these three main categories, you have various things, right? Innovating out of it, the PayPal, Venmo, um, cash app, Zelle, you know, are all different variations of um, these three basic reels. That is, that's great. I, I, I like that. Let's, 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 um, let's go back to that. So I want, I want to make sure people understand that because I try to put it in the comments, but I'm having a misspelling of the, of the payment. Three main payment rails. Mm -hmm. We have account rails, right? And that will deal with, you would need an account number. So that I would assume that's bank to bank types of transfers. 
We yeah. have card rails, right? So the credit card transactions where you look at the major credit card networks like Visa and MasterCard. Now you mentioned. have and, and the different merchant type of payments that they, you would have at, at various stores. Then you have crypto rails. So those are the, the three main categories of rails, of yeah. payment rails. Yes. Okay. That's very, very interesting how you do that. And then from there, it starts branching off on various new technologies that um, work within those rails to facilitate the movement of money. That that That's awesome. That's great clarity on that. Um, so beyond those... Try, okay, cool. Uh, I just wanted to push it just a little bit more. So let's go yeah. back to transport, right? You would know that on the road on the on the road transport or the road infrastructure, you can have buses, you can have cars, you can have depending on um, where you are. In Africa, we have the Okadas. Anybody in your Okada here? The the yeah. bikes, yeah. So you my can mom, have the bike. My mom invested in some of those. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, cool. So you can have. You can have the you can have the um and the, the bikes as well and all these guys are on the road rails right going to air you have the commercial flights you have the private jets you have the helicopters and maybe you can mm -hmm. slot in the rockets somewhere everything goes on the air right but there are different vehicles with all their nuances you go to the water and that's you can have rail. but to that point exactly. so I can, that's the air mm -hmm. rail but we have air the road exactly. The same exactly. way, and then from there, you can have the different technologies within those rails, whether it's car, the Okada, bike, motorcycle, same way with private jet. Now they're going to space and stuff like that. Uh -huh. That still deals uh -huh. with the air. Uh, this is this is good. I love it. Please. Let's, exactly. let's, you know, now, now it's becoming so, because, you know, being in fintech, we hear all these things, we work with all these things, but the way you're breaking it down, absolutely love it. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I wanted to make sure that I understood it, number one. And with my excitement, I want to make sure the audience understands it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to sign the last one. So the same thing with the water, too. So you can have the very little boats, the canoes, down to the yachts, right? So you have all these different kind of bodies that, you know, can exist on water and can help transport people from one place to the other. Same thing with payment. So... If something is account to account based, you can go from mobile money type kind of stuff. Um, for the North America, is PayPal, Zelle, Cash App. We don't do those in Africa. Sometimes, you know, you can have some of them here. Like I think PayPal is in one or two countries in Africa, but we have the different things, right? M-Pesa for Kenya. In Nigeria, we have Paga. We have um, Ope. We have various things that you know are, are on the same account rails for the card rails we have the vev card that is the homegrown solution and um, we also have visa we have mastercard so par rail you now have these different stakeholders and their branding and then the various technologies that are you know tying all of them but if you understand that from the foundation you know it's easy to say hmm what's this new thing is it innovating on something existing or is it totally totally new you know, like a disruption, just like crypto. So, so a question: Was crypto the last new rail that we've seen so far? Yes, yes, it was. Yes. So, since crypto, there has not been a new rail. There's been um, various vehicles within those rails, but 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 beyond crypto, we haven't seen a new payment rail. We, we haven't and in some places crypto is still in and out of the hospital on life support so it's still trying to make its way in <laughs> yes, i love it um so question for you so and i think i know the answer to this but correct me if i'm wrong when we start talking about the digital wallet right now that sounds to me that that's more of an account rail is that accurate yes it is yes it is um but so um, you're, you're looking at you're looking at um, consumer behavior, and you're looking at how to reduce friction, right? And on some things, um, so you're juxtaposing you're juxtaposing convenience for the customer as well as the points that they can use their money at. Um, let me break down, break that down a bit. Um, if I have my money in a particular format, 
let's say I'm really, really traditional. And so I have my money in a calabash at home. And it's a lot of money. It's $1 million. I've saved it, got uh, an inheritance, whatever it is. And everything came down to $1 million. So I'm good with money, right? I, I don't need a loan or anything. I can pay for whatever it is I want. And then I arrive at the airport quite early. And I'm hoping to buy a ticket. And then I ask them how much the ticket is. And they say $500. And I'm like, okay, yeah, good. I have $500. I can pay. Okay, we accept cash check and i have none of those i have money in a calabash at home i would not be able to use that money even though i have money so there's something called having your money have an identity in the digital space and that money um being able to use that money in the digital space in some wallet situations you have the money but you have it locked up in a repository where you can't use it, where your customers can't use it, um, except for a few cases. Tying a card to that wallet enables it to have more expressions in the digital space. And so that's why people don't just keep money in a, in a, in a wallet. They tie some other what we call tokens to it so that it can have more expressions. Um, if you want me to go in more on that, you know, I'll... I, I can do that, no. but let me just hold. No, I think no. This is this is a great. We have a lot of comments, so I want to I want to use a comment. And and before we move on, before your analogy for people that don't understand what a calabash is, can you explain that? Uh, it's um okay. So let's see. It's not um it's like a piggy bank, but it's made of clay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. So let's go. Let's go with the different comments we have. I'm going to start early. We had a comment um, twelve minutes ago. Dr. Romy, I've seen a lot of startups in, in the fintech space in Africa, and particularly Nigeria. Are there safe investment opportunities for stakeholders? And what are some of the regulations to be aware of? That's a good question. Um, you want me to answer it immediately? Um, if you have the answer to that, uh, we can we can yeah, definitely answer and then we'll go on to some other comments. OK. So for um, investors, so it's, it's, um, it's a question I'll need, you know, a lot of um, angles to it. But there are a couple of things to be aware of um, when you're coming to invest um, in, in Nigeria. It's very regulated. It's really regulated. In fact, that's one of the things people see as um, a drawback to growth um, because there are a couple of regulators. There are regulators that you might be aware of, like SEC, that regulate anything having to do with um, investing, storing money, crowdfunding money, asset management, that kind of thing. But you also have the central bank that regulates most of the payment companies. And these payment companies have various licenses that are assigned to them and they enable them to do different things. Um, I, and when I consult, I break it into four things, right? It's either you have a license to hold money. That's like the highest of the licenses. You have a license to hold money in various categories. Is that, that you, is that that you have a license to hold money in a wallet form? You have a license to hold money in a microfinance bank form, or you have the full blown license where you're holding money as a commercial bank. There are a few others, but I think these are the three major ones then you have the license to move money around. Some people just have the license to hold money. Many more people have the license to move money around. This is where you see the payment gateways, the guys that are the PSSPs, um, payment service providers. So they Stripe type kind of people, aiding kind of people. There's a license for that. They are very regulated. You have a license to innovate around things that hold money. So the card-related licenses, you are digitizing money, you are allowed to do cards, you are allowed to do payment links, payment codes, that kind of thing. Then you have the license that allows you to um, create technology or manage technology that helps to move money around. These are the licenses that help you with the touch points. Touch points are places that I can use my digital money. So you have a license that helps you to deploy POS terminals and to do stuff around POS terminals. Dr. Abidoye might, might know that um, POS terminals are like the dominant terminals, especially, especially in Nigeria. Nigeria is like the biggest market in Africa. And you've heard about agency banking. So people that do agency banking, that are licensed for agency banking, have these um, kind of licenses. 
So when you're investing, you're looking at people that are adhering to licenses, you know, that are in that region. If somebody is telling you that they want to be collecting money from customers, they don't have strong partnerships they can show you evidence for, or the licenses, you should be you getting, you know, worried because that investment may go awry at some point. Um, and then you're looking for, you know, other things like um, if they say that they're acquiring customers, where are they? Customers are not in virtual reality. Um, if your product is being used by human beings, you know, as against bots, people will know about it. You know, you would, <laughs> there'll be evidence of it because I'm, I'm putting this part out because there have been cases of people saying we have X number of customers. And when you come on ground, you discover that those people are nowhere to be found. If people are using the product, you would know about it, you know, somewhat. Um, and then the other things that you need to know, you know, about normal investing, the due diligence and um, governance um, around um, the, the, the businesses that is not necessarily fintech related. But some of these things I've said so far are fintech um, and related. Investment opportunities, yes. Um, perhaps you might need to look into a lot of the reports that are coming out from the region, you know, to um, dive deep. But that's just the answer in a nutshell. Now, nah, great, great um, insight. I was laughing because look, what I know people, you know, say all this stuff about Nigeria and all these foreign not, but listen, we see the same thing in America at times with some of these um people who they're getting locked up right now from, from different companies that had fake people and they're getting sued by by investment banks. So it's a global issue in terms of fraud. Just had to throw that out there. <laughs> um, so the next thing. That means blockchain is another payment rail. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Would it be considered the crypto pay payment rail or the blockchain payment rail? The crypto is the payment rail. The blockchain is the technology that um, underpins that payment rail. So blockchain technology, crypto is a manifestation of um, that technology in the payment space. Got it. All right. So we have comment. Uh, one million dollars in the calabash is spiritual money. <laughs> yeah, analogy, love it. Um, it's made from the one true garden, calabash. They're back on the calabash, and uh, he says, and the central bank does not play. Yeah, we had a um, there was a major regulation around crypto, and we had one of our previous uh. Yes, and we talked about the central bank when it came out with all the regulations um, previously. That was an episode we did to Nigeria, uh, Chigozi, um last year. Um, yeah, but it's it's in our catalog, and we'll be talking about the central bank. All right, good good stuff. I just had to, you know, we we try to give the audience some um, answer their their questions. So circling back now, I mean, we we discussed a lot. I think. You setting it up with the different types of three payment rails in terms of uh -huh. account payment card rails and crypto rails, it made it so much clearer now to see because now when we start looking at the different technologies, the 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 goal will be to understand which payment rail is that technology associated with, which exactly. payment rail is that technology a vehicle of. So thank you for that because that made things a lot clearer. And, and, and following on that, from an innovation standpoint, because mm -hmm. you're real, you you have your your fingertips on the pulse of what's going on. Do you see another payment rail coming to fruition? Are there talks about another payment rail in terms of where the future is going, like a fourth payment rail? Um, no, and even though I don't operate a crypt, um, what, what they call those things, um, a crystal ball, I am I'm, I'm not clairvoyant, uh, but no, and I'll tell you why. Um, because the existing payment rails haven't solved the problem, solved the problems, you know, of payments in many places, right? Um, it's not just Africa, in many places, but specifically for Africa, there's this thing we say. In the payment space and i can see a couple of my colleagues here um we say that for some african countries it's easier for you to get money in a suitcase and board a flight and go to a country and drop the money there's faster than using digital payments to send that money um and it's because africa is quite fragmented 
um, even though a lot of work has gone on, you know, and then it's still going on, it's way better than it was before. Many of the fintechs are working really hard to solve the problem, but the problem, you know, still exists. So I'm wondering um, why another payment rail, right? If the ones that are there haven't been flogged or haven't been used, you know, to a maximum capacity. Um, so what I'll be voting for instead is for more interoperability um because money is what money is money is power um people that have you know um, higher currencies or stronger currencies sort of rule the world um in different ways um what i'll be what 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 i'll be thinking or what i would vote for is for the governments to soften their power and come together um, to make sure that we can have money flow smoothly or more seamlessly across borders in Africa and even out of Africa. I think the continent, in my own view, that has solved this the most um, is Europe. So the SEPA payments rail that is account-based in Europe connects 36 countries in Europe. And it's very easy to move money from one place to another place across those 36 borders. You know, um, first of all, because they've unified their currency. So clearing and settlement, which is a really big problem. Um, if you want me to go into that, you know, I could. Um, but clearing and settlement is really solved, right? And um, so they have a lot of cohesion um, in that in that um, region. It's not the same thing in most places. Yes, so I'll be voting for that instead of for a fourth payment rail. Yeah, I'd like to get into the process of, you know, that that what you what you mentioned in terms of the the clearing and settlements, we can understand that. But before we get into that, right, the question that I had, a basic question, because based on the analogy and earlier that you said versus you know, the joke inside with your colleagues is that it's faster to move money in a briefcase or just just literally take the cash and move. When you we're dealing with cash, are uh -huh cash does that fit into a payment rail like how do, what's the analogy there is that fit into an accounts payment rail because or or does it only fit if i deposit the money but if i just if me and you exchange cash but we keep it in our calabash does that does it is that part of a payment rail or is that outside of the payment rail that's what i want to understand perhaps it is but it's not part of the digital payment rails um, and I guess what we're talking about is digital payment rails. So it's not part of, of the digital payment rails. I guess there are um, various other physical payment rails that happened before the digital ones. So I mean, the gold, um, the trade by butter, maybe um, the cash, you know, um, yes, all those ones happened before and had their own problems and also their own benefits. But coming down to digital, you must put the money, the cash, in an account for it to have a digital expression. Let's and let's go back to that so people can understand the origin because that's a because I didn't understand it until you just said it. Um, if we rewind prior to, uh -huh. to the three payment rails, those are the three digital payment rails. But there's still yeah. the idea of a physical payment rail. So if I took a briefcase of cash and gave it to you, that's uh -huh. an idea of a physical payment rail. Am I, is, am I accurate with that description? Yes, yes, because money has moved. Okay, so the idea, the essence of a payment rail is something of value moving. Because if yes. we took the something of value, if we're not talking about money like cash, you mentioned gold, right? That was of value or silver. Or in the case of bartering, right? I have, yeah. I don't know, a, 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 a glassware and I want to trade your my glassware for grain, right? So the idea of a payment rail is value being exchanged and moving. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yes. Wow, that's cool. Because uh, it really it really kind of helps me now like get a, a deeper understanding of this conversation. I mean, listen, I. I, I know people um, in the audience for years have benefited from this show, but a lot of the times is really for my own selfish purpose of getting experts on and helping me understand things that I didn't understand before. So I think I totally, you know, that that's my labor of love for this show is really getting a, a deeper understanding of these aspects. So thank you for that. So, okay. 
that's a really important definition. The idea of a payment rail is a transfer of value. Whether if we look in the physical space prior to the digital space, that's just us exchanging value in some way, shape, or form. So that's the payment rail. Now, if we take yeah. it to the digital space, there are only three payment rails in the digital space. Accounts, mm -hmm. cards, and crypto. Okay. So now, circling back to what you said earlier, in terms of I'm, I'm using one, of, let's use accounts, for instance. I want to go through the rest. When we're using the accounts, what is that process of I send it? What's the clearing and settlement process? How does that work? Awesome. So um, let me go a little bit above that to say in the digital payment space, um, when, um, regardless of the rails that you're using, um, there's this thing about bring cash or bring a trusted entity. So is that you're giving me the value I seek right, right now, and I, and I let you go with the services or the goods I'm selling as a merchant, right? Or you bring something that I can trust. Um, right, so it's, it's either of those two. So this is what happens, and um, we belabor this subject in our online school of fintech um, in the institution I run. We say that at the end of an online transaction, you go to Amazon and you buy something, you go to eBay, you buy something, you go to an airline and you purchase a ticket. At the end of that transaction, two people are happy, but one person is happy and hopeful. He's happy, the merchant is happy because he has made a sale, but he doesn't have the money, right? He's happy and he's hopeful because he doesn't have the money. If you step back from the merchant's accepting payments as uh, accepting um, payment tokens as a means of paying for their goods and services, you also need to look at the fundamentals of the merchant business. Liquidity, the fact that you have cash to run your business is central to the merchant business or to anything a business owner you know, is doing. And we can go into a lot of examples and I can give you a few. So I'm this digital creator on YouTube. I'm maybe you know, affiliated to Mr. Beast. And so we make tons of money, more than a lot of companies in Africa and even North America, right? So good business, right? But we are okay with waiting for YouTube to pay us at whatever time they want to pay us, right? Because we don't need the liquid to run our business. We are content creators. We have our gear, we have our cameras, whatever it is, and we have the ideas and the script, you know, from our head, and then we run and we move, and then we get money, right? But compare that to Walmart. Walmart needs to get produce from, from farmers, and they need to ship that. So they need to pay somebody to ship that to them. They need to get manif um, stuff from the manufacturers that have imported it from China, wherever it is. Most of these relationships, you need to have money down before you collect those goods, right? Um, same thing with airlines and all of that. So this is what is at the back of, because you need to understand who this merchant is and why they even need payment in the first place. So that you are designing what they need, not what you like. Now, at the back of this merchant, um, this is what is in your head. Like you are buying, you're selling, you're buying the loaves of bread, but at the end of the day, they're just making sure that they're, they're just hoping that they have just enough to pay the supplier so that they'll give them a fresh dose tomorrow for business to continue. So if he comes into, in, into Walmart and if he buys 10 loaves of bread, right let's say for very simple purposes that one loaf of bread is ten dollars so ten loaves is hundred dollars so i pay with my card and i pay um, i pay the merchant hundred dollars for the ten loaves of bread i'm very happy i have a hungry household they're waiting for me to make sandwiches and i run home yay we have food we're happy our problem is solved walmart is happy but they are happy and hopeful they don't have the money yet why don't they have the money? Because in that thing that was printed when I paid with my card is a trust. It's a trust certificate. It's a trust saying that somebody that knows me and knows that I have money and somebody that is in charge of banking Walmart, both of them would make sure that the money gets, that my $100 gets to Walmart at an agreed date. I'm not 
concerned as a customer i'm not concerned with that transaction walmart is the one that has the hope so when does this hope get fulfilled it gets fulfilled most of the time is the next day so you hear um settlement happens you know t plus one that is t the date of the transaction plus one what happens at settlement everything that has been paid to walmart and has been paid to their bankers they would go to a room virtually called the clearing room and everybody will present um logs or records of what has been transacted so walmart will say oh, i had um 10 000 customers you know pay me whatever amount walmart will be saying it walmart bank will be saying that when when they finish all this consultation and whatever it is just make sure that the files are fine and everything there is a third process called settlement that is when the actual money moves again in the school of fintech we say in payments money does not move data moves that is why if you're in if you're you know learning anything data here data analytics data engineering data science you should be in payments because it's it, money money doesn't move data moves anything having to do with how to optimize the movement of data would make payments you know more fantastic subject to regulations of course so is that settlements that this money moves and it's at that time that first of all what, the money moves to walmart's bank and then the money moves from walmart's bank to walmart that is when they now look into the account and they now see a plus 100 from if that has finished eating the bread by the way so i finished eating the bread because i bought it one day before you know done dusted but that is the time that the money is arriving at their bank account now, of course, this kind of relationship doesn't work for a lot of banks, for a lot of merchants. That's why you see merchants saying things like, oh, I want same day settlement. I want instant settlement. It's because of their liquidity requirements. And a lot of fintechs are innovating around these use cases because they are looking at the needs of a merchant. Most of the innovation we see in payments is focused on the needs of a merchant. That was an excellent breakdown. There's a lot to discuss there. I love the happy and hopeful. And I think we have a comment about that. Before we, we're gonna come, we're gonna have to take a moment for our sponsors and we're gonna come back and I wanna um, break all of that down. We're gonna take a moment from our sponsors right now and then we'll be right back. Are you an emerging FinTech with a limited budget seeking more sales and partners? Introducing Strategic Generation, your partner in leveraging cybersecurity for sales and partner enablement. FinTechs often lose opportunities due to unsophisticated cybersecurity programs. That's where we come in. Strategic Generation assists with due diligence, security posture visibility, penetration testing, and on-demand virtual CISO services. We connect your systems to our partnered platform and voila, instant access to real-time diagnostics and compliance frameworks such as SOC 2 and PCI DSS. Gain the confidence of prospects and partners, strengthen your cybersecurity program and drive success. Stop losing deals due to cybersecurity. Visit strategicgeneration.com and click on On Demand CISO to connect with an expert. Just like that, we are back. All right. Um, I love it. I love all of it because it's, it's really helping to um, understand. So I want us take us. I want to take a step back to. I think I'm going to do the same. Wait one second. I'm going to. I think we're on the same page. Me and Hillary. Happy and hopeful. Very interesting concept. I a hundred percent agree. So you said now we have a situation with the merchant and the the buyer. Right, we're going to just say merchant and buyer. As soon as the buyer purchases the product, uh -huh. they're happy. Yeah, totally happy. The merchant, on the other hand, is happy and hopeful. And the reason I want to I want to drill down on this is because of the big idea of fraud. Right, so they're happy and hopeful. They haven't fully received the the money yet. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they are their payment, right? Because, but the, the, the buyer 
receive the product. So they're happy. Merchant is happy and hopeful. In a perfect scenario, right, it's going to go through clearing, where it's T plus one, the date of the transaction, and the next day, all of the different transactions that happen are now, they have to be cleared and, and, and verified. T plus two, in most cases, is going to go to settlement in a perfect world where the actual merchant now gets the um, the payment. Now they're happy, right? Because the hope is gone. Is that a, is that a clear understanding? Um, of what you of what you said, I want to make sure I'm on the right page. Uh, clearing and settlement both happen T plus one, so settlement doesn't yeah. have another log, so it happens normally around the same time. Okay, so once again, so now T plus one will be the clearing and settlement where the actual um, funds are then deposited into the merchant account. So now they're they're totally happy. We have a. Uh, before I, add, I get to Hillary's question, the question I have real quick is what happens in the case of fraud? Okay, so um, it, it depends on the kind of fraud you know you are um, speaking about. Um, maybe you want to talk about the chargeback fraud. So yeah. chargeback is a normal thing, right? But there's also the chargeback or the what they call friendly fraud. I don't see anything friendly about it, but yes, it's, it's normally called friendly fraud, right? So um, chargeback or the disputes um, is a way for, is a way to protect the customer. Again, um, in, in the case where the customer is getting these goods from a remote source, so ordering from Amazon or any you know online store, um, I could order a pair of shoes that were handmade, leather, stitched, whatever it is, you know, really high quality. And they put a price, I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, I, I really need, need this. And then what comes to me is very cheap, substandard leather, you know, tacked in different places. And you've collected my money. It provides me an avenue to go and complain and say, this is not what I got, or I was expecting this in seven days and it didn't come in seven days. And the party I want to wear it for, right, is gone and whatever. So I can go complain and they can demand of the merchants to make it right. That's normal chargeback. Many people have found that that, uh, and in normal chargeback, there are rules. There are rules per the different schemes or the different ways money is managed on the rails, right? There are rules. So some people have found out that that um, some of the merchants have not optimized their processes to take care of these rules. The truth is that many people walk into doing stuff around payments without understanding um, um, a lot about it. Maybe we don't have a lot of information you know, about that um, outside. We are trying to solve that problem in our own way. Or maybe they're just all about the money, just like many people go into crypto thinking about the money until they get burnt. Whatever it is, um, people do not take care of chargebacks well. And one of the laws of chargebacks is that if you don't respond in a particular time, in a timely fashion, it is assumed that you're in the wrong and then money will be collected from you. And so what a lot of um, consumers do is that they exploit this. They go and say, yay, we did not receive it, but it's sitting right there. They are, you know, they are wearing it, they are using it, they are drinking it, they are whatever it is, but they'll go in and log a request and say they didn't get these things. The merchant does not respond in a timely fashion. And of course the money is sent back to the customer that is um, the chargeback or friendly fraud. So, how does that work if it's settled in T plus one? But a week later, I say, okay, you know what? I I don't like this product for whatever reason. It didn't meet my specifications. How does that How does that work? Does the that's a, that's a very good question. Um, there's something called, so there, um, there's a body of work to making payments happen. And a lot is hinged around managing the person that sells. Because if the person that sells, sells properly, many people will be encouraged to do e-commerce and many people will go remove their money from their mattresses, their basements, their whatever it is, and put it in the banks because they've seen more use for it, right? If everywhere you and I go to Namdi and then they're asking for crypto and we like some of those things. So we go to the baseball and they said, um, maybe a game or something, the NFL, and they said, 
if you have cash, pay $100. If you have crypto, give us $20. We're like, hmm, so that means if I have crypto, you know, you know. And then you go to the mall and they said, if you want to buy this loaf of bread, $10. If you want to pay in crypto, $3. We're like, oh, this crypto again. The next thing you and I are going to do is we'll start reconfiguring our itinerary to go to the bank and get crypto because it's coming up and it's very useful. So if many people are buying things and that experience is successful, the truth is that many people will pitch in for payments, whatever kind of payments, and they want to, I mean, there's a body, there's a concerted effort to make that happen. One of the ways is to make sure that the merchants are well behaved, right? If they say that they are going to sell this thing to you, they're going to sell exactly the same thing. If they say they're going to deliver in three days, it is three days, not 15 days, you know, and all that. And if it's not delivered properly, they are mandated to make it right. In fact, they've gone on to also make sure that any charges associated with that payment is the merchant that pays it as well. It might look like it's um, not fair, but the truth is that you're helping the merchant sell more. Because um, if the merchant was in my village, the only person that they will be selling to is my grandmother, my grandfather, my granduncles, and every other person. But right now, you've put a payment link on their website, and somebody from South Africa is buying those services. Somebody from Lagos, somebody from New York, you know, is buying those services. So you have increased their risk, their reach. You're helping them not deal with physical money. So somebody breaks into the shop, they're going to see virtual stuff there, right? All the money is in the cloud. So what can you steal? You can only maybe beat me. So maybe that's why, you know, they are burdening this merchant, you know, that much. But this is what happens. Back to your question. I just wanted to set the background. No, that's 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 awesome. And I know um, we're, we're getting towards time, so I want to make sure I get the okay. audience questions answered too. Hillary just said, what is a processor and where do they fit in payments? A processor is somebody that helps to process um, a transaction. In the payment world, we've been talking about two people so far. We've been talking about the merchant and then the buyer or the customer. The truth is that there is a four or a six party model. So there are six people are, are, that are actually in that payment chain trying to make things happen. You have the merchant and the merchant bank called the acquirer. You have the customer and then the person that's representing them where they have placed their money to become digital money. That's called the issuer. And then you have the scheme that is in the middle orchestrating trust between the acquirer and the issuer. That's the fifth person. But remember, I have always pointed out how the merchant is very important in this conversation we've been having. So to make sure that the merchant's needs are attended to, there is this, this group of people called the service providers. They sit in between the merchant and then the acquirer. And um, this is where you have people like Stripe, if you're in Nigeria or Africa, people like Flutterwave. In Nigeria and some parts of Africa, people like Paystack. Um, you have all those people in the service provider category. Um, these people, as well as some other players called the third party processors, enable payments go on seamlessly. Why? Because the earlier guys I mentioned, the acquirers and the issuers are traditional bankers. It's bankers that have this kind of licenses for a lot of reasons that will not accommodate in this call. Um, and so they don't do the business of innovating around payments as well as they should. So there are other players that don't have the banking load on them. They are not looking for deposits. They are not looking for cash reserve ratios. They are not looking for all those things that bankers are saddled with. These are the guys, if you have seen from what has been happening, you know, from what has happened in Stripe, in Aiden, in Square, in Klarna, these are the guys that are actually pushing the frontiers of innovation in payments because they are best positioned to do that, right? Um, and they are the guys that um, help all these things we call processing happen seamlessly. So all the innovation you've seen in payments are really because of the processors and, and it's, it's arguable, but that's my perspective. Listen, um, if he, I consider you now a friend of the show, you're someone I wanna bring back because there's so much to cover and that we didn't even um, touch on. And I want to, that I want to understand, I have so many questions, but with the conversation we've had, I have a very clear understanding of payment wealth. And I think our audience does too. 
And this is a this is a show where certain parts I'm going to rewind to get that clarity. I'm going to even reference in the future if I have to get into a conversation with a with a fintech um, a, around around payment rails. Um, Hillary is saying thank you very much. Thank you, Hillary, for your comments. Really, you rock Thanks. star. Thanks for for, for really, um, joining in and commenting. One of the things I like to do for my guests, we started doing this. I want to give you the floor and talk about your business, how people can find you and so forth. I'm going to get off the stage and I'm going to give you the floor to do that. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me. My light suddenly went off. Um, but my name is Ifi and I am the managing partner and founder of a fintech insights company called The Payment Log. Um, it's derived from two words, payments and then dialogue. What we are doing is to provide as much insights to a group of people, to fintech professionals, to fintech founders, to fintech investors, and to people that would like to use fintech in their business. We are doing this in twofold at the moment. We have an online fintech school that has very robust courses from um, courses that provide a deep dive into payments for you into also very detailed stuff like fintech operations, fintech product strategy, and fintech engineering. We have a bootcamp for that. Apart from that, we provide insights into trends and um, various things that fintech investors and fintech founders would want to know um, about. If you would like to know more about that, um, please shoot us an email at info at the payment log dot com we are on um, twitter we are on linkedin linkedin is the payment log um, you can also give me a shout out at uh, my linkedin address as well i'm very um visible on, on linkedin i i do linkedin a lot so um just ify at linkedin i p h i e um and i'll be happy to chat about payments especially in africa with you thanks um for having me thanks namdi so yes that's the that's the website. So, um, and thanks for that. Like, I, I, you know, after this episode and, and what you said, I, I think I want to actually be, a, um, I want to go into payment log and see how I can leverage it and, and, and get information. I, you know, we're always interested in, in learning. I'm passionate about FinTech, as you can see, um, and I'm always interested in learning more about it. So I want to look the payment log up and um, really try to see if I can get some knowledge from what you said. So thank you for that. Um, oh, Ify. Brilliant um, episode. Like I said, consider you a friend of the show. I uh, would we'll definitely be reaching out to you so we can probably discuss more topics because it, it's such a robust topic and it it controls you know commerce on a global scale and there's so exactly. much, so many different nuances to understand. And um, I'll definitely and then, you know and, and also with, with our friends of the show when. Um, Sometimes something happens that's big in the news. I like to bring on someone like yourself that's big in the news around payments, payment rails, a new regulation. I like to bring someone like you on so we can really break it down and so everyone can really understand. Sometimes, you know, some of these stuff that they're talking about it, people don't fully get it. They're like, yeah, I heard about it. But having someone like you, we can just break it down and go in depth. I think that's really beneficial to the audience. Um, you have another comment. Great insights, Ify. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're thank all really you. happy for the for the conversation. On that note, you can find us on um, techbehindfintech.com. Um, we're, we're live every Friday. We have a, a series of really interesting conversations um, for the on the next you know every Friday, 12 p.m. EST. Different experts talking about various things within fintech. So please uh, join us um, live Friday, 12 p.m. EST. Whether you're watching the show live, you can also watch it on our, um, our website, techbehindfintech.com. Let me post that website and you can drop your email there as well and um, become part of our, our list so you won't miss an episode. We also have a backlog of over 165 shows. So if you want to Go to the site, look at our page. You can um, you can see uh, different past episodes and things of that nature. So on that note, I think that concludes our conversation today. Um, I wish everyone a, a good weekend. I think someone said something. The FYI. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So thank you very much, um, Ify, for joining us. 
And to our guests, thank you very much. Um, thanks for all the comments. Thanks for all the DMs, the messages. You guys really kept the show going and alive. We really appreciate this episode. It's very dynamic. And to, on that note, I wish everyone a great weekend. Happy, take care. Cheers. Bye. Understanding the technology that powers the money is essential. Knowing the business drivers that inspire how the money is made is crucial. Bridging the gap between the mind of the technologist and the mind of the business is monumental. That is what TBF is all about. Let's start this never-ending conversation. It's time.